Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Iron Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, protests, clashes, and sympathy demonstrations across Tunisia. More rallies are held in Kasserine against the high rate of unemployment and the recent death of a jobless man. Also, hundreds of thousands of Eritreans have applied for asylum in Europe over the last few years. The country is the continent's biggest source of refugees. We have a rare chat with the Eritrean ambassador about the reports of repression at home driving out so many. And in football, host Rwanda storms through to the quarterfinal of the African Nations Championships. They're joined in the knockout stage by Ivory Coast, who pip Morocco 1-0 in the second group match. We hear from our man on the ground. First, in Tunisia, police clashed once again with those protesting the high rate of unemployment and a growing sense of frustration. A curfew had been imposed in the city of Kasserine, but many demonstrators defied the order there. Rallies were also held in cities and towns across the country. Police firing tear gas as hundreds demand jobs in the impoverished city of Kasserine. Large crowds burned tyres and angrily chanted during a second day of demonstrations. As residents and citizens from Kasserine, we ask for more jobs and dignity. Tensions here have been high since Saturday. Anger was sparked by a young man's accidental death. He was electrocuted whilst threatening to commit suicide after having been rejected for a public sector job. The tragedy echoed the suicide of a market seller that sparked the 2011 revolution. Wednesday saw clashes break out across the country, with many protesters saying little has changed in five years. Today we're convinced there can be another revolution, because many things have not changed since the 2011 protests. All we've gotten from the first revolution is freedom. We have yet to obtain employment and dignity. Unemployment now stands at more than 15% in Tunisia. Last year's terrorist attacks in Tunis and Sousse badly hurt the economy, particularly the crucial tourism sector. They are fears increased tensions could destabilize Tunisia the only country that has successfully transitioned to democracy since the Arab Spring. Sierra Leone confirmed a second case of Ebola in less than a week. It's a disappointing setback for the country and the region, coming just seven days after the World Health Organization had given West Africa the all-clear for the deadly virus. The two-year epidemic has killed more than 11,000 people. At the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, an investment of $5 million into the research and development of preventative medicines for e Ebola was announced by a global vaccine alliance on Wednesday. Rights activists in Zimbabwe say that they're delighted with a ruling by the Constitutional Court to outlaw child marriages. Wednesday's move came after two former child brides took the government to court in a groundbreaking case. The pair asked for the widespread practice to be declared unconstitutional, labelling it a form of child abuse. Well, judges ruled that child marriages can have horrific consequences and that from January 20th, no one under 18 can wed. The leading source of African refugees in Europe is Eritrea. Many say that they've fled chronic human rights abuses, including repression, violence and indefinite national service. Well, Eritrean authorities rarely speak to the media. Our correspondent, Nicolas Schumer, met the nation's ambassador to France and asked why an estimated 5,000 of her countrymen were fleeing every month. Well, she's un unconvinced that all Eritreans applying for refugee status should get it. Many European countries have a preferential treatment of Eritrea because there is a campaign against Eritrea. There is a political campaign to, to, stabilize, to destabilize the country. So they are, they are giving a preferential treatment to Eritreans and many people coming from sub-Saharan Africa, they claim Eritrean citizenship and this is not good. This has become a pull factor also.
In Eritrea, there's only one political party. There's no independent media. You've had the same president for more than two decades. When is this going to change? This will, will change with time, but uh, we are still in a situation where uh, there is still a threat of war. Ethiopian officials, uh, they are still uh, threatening Eritrea, threatening of uh, teaching us a lesson. So still there is a threat of war. We can easily do like in many other African countries and uh, uh, do some, uh, some fake elections and, and say we are doing elections. But uh, we have to see also in many African countries, you know, uh, presidents, heads of state are changing constitutions to have third, fourth or fifth mandates. And uh, uh, it looks like they have implicit uh, agreement from uh, the international community or from, or from uh, rich countries because uh, we don't hear much criticism about them as uh, in, uh, against Eritrea. Organizations like Human Rights Watch say that in Eritrea there are political prisoners and that many of them are tortured. What do you respond to that accusation? There is no political prisoner and there is no torture in Eritrea. Um, we have some uh, maybe prisoners linked with uh, the emergency situation of the country. Elements which try to destabilize the, uh, the country. Actions are taken by the government and we cannot place the situation out of this uh, context. For many years now, Ethiopia has been occupying some territories that belong to Eritrea. Why do you think the international community isn't doing anything about this? Most of uh, Ethiopia's allies, and the biggest is, is uh, the United States, they did, they did want to satisfy Ethiopia's uh, uh, needs or Ethiopia's wants because uh, Ethiopia is their ally from the very beginning. It's a big population, it's a big market, so it's a question of, uh, of geopolitical interests. Nick Reshima there speaking to Eritrea's ambassador to France. Well, to Brazil, where a team of Senegalese researchers have been drafted in to help worried scientists there battle the Zika virus. It's a mild form of dengue fever that's been linked to an increase in the number of babies born with a birth defect characterised by an unusually small head. The team, led by Professor Amadou Al-Fassal, has been studying Zika for years. In Africa, they're used to these kinds of emergencies. Just months ago, they were still in the midst of an Ebola outbreak, experience that helps to put their Brazilian colleagues at ease. When you go into combat, to war, you feel reassured when you're with people who've already been at the center of the action and survived, who know what to do in this kind of situation. It's something that keeps us calm, that reassures us, because we can sense the skill in this group. The things they're doing have already been tested. Sometimes we'll ask them, why not do it this way? And the answer is, we've already tried it. And in this case, we had problems, so this is why we're doing it another way. The Senegalese team is putting measures in place to isolate the virus. The Brazilians must be able to diagnose cases as quickly as possible. What the Dakar team is bringing is all the know-how on Zika. How to isolate it, what distinguishes the virus, how do we identify it, and how do we detect it. So this is our routine in Dakar, and that's transferred here, and we're already at the end of the process. This transatlantic partnership is a source of pride for the team from Senegal. We spend years waiting for everything from the north. Now in Africa and in southern countries, people have been trained, they have skills. You just have to give them the means, and there has to be political will behind them so they have the tools, and their laboratories are properly equipped, and they have the training, and they really know what they're doing. In the coming days, the researchers will head to the north of Brazil, their goal to better understand the link between the Zika virus and cases of microcephaly, a connection that's yet to be fully established. While in football, hosts Rwanda stormed through to the quarterfinals of the African Nations Championships with a victory over Gabon on Wednesday. Our Duncan Woodside was pitchside. 
Rwanda stormed through to the quarterfinals here this afternoon thanks to two goals, one either side of half time by Ernest Sugira. The second, a spectacular drive. Gabon managed a consolation goal and they also went close in the closing stages, hitting the woodwork, but that wasn't enough to secure them a point. Now, in the game here this evening at the Amahoro Stadium, Morocco again disappointed. Uh, they drew their first match 0 0 against Gabon, and then this evening they lost 1 0 to Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast winning thanks to a dis Disputed penalty just before half time. In the second half, Morocco pressed for an equaliser sporadically, hitting the bar in the early stages of that second half. But uh, they really threatened very little in a game which was largely controlled by Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast pro prospects now look good in terms of uh, their chances of qualification for the quarterfinals. Morocco, meanwhile, will have to win their final game here and probably by quite some margin against Rwanda in order to have any chance of qualifying for those quarterfinals. Well, that's it for Across Africa. Stay with us. More coming up.